I'm very thankful for it. I, I always say like the best thing my parents gave me was nothing. Yeah. Like they gave me love and, and you know, taught me things and showed me like morals and ethics and fed me, housed me of course. Yeah. But they, there was no like, here's your, you know, tuitions paid this yeah. and that there, it was like you had to work for what you got. It was a can and a can do attitude. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I would like to welcome one of my good friends. You're the man of the people. I'll tell you what. Uh, you, which, which just makes sense that you're the man of the people because your your brewery is beer for people. I was gonna say that that that's part of the inspiration. It's part of the yeah. inspiration. Yeah, I love that. So very uh, egalitarian. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm sure it means something. I got my buddy here, Sam McNulty. He is the co-owner, co-founder of, I mean, one of the best beers in Northeast Ohio and Cleveland, now in Michigan, Market Garden. Yeah, as of three weeks ago, we, for the first time ever, yeah. s- you know, sent our beer outside of the state of Ohio. Yeah. And we, we uh, launched into Michigan in, in early days, but three weeks in, it's selling like hot, the Market Garden beer is selling like hotcakes. I love it, I love it. We're gonna, well, I mean, they don't know real beer up in Michigan, so we're just doing them. That's part of our charity. We're going to write it off on our taxes. There you go. Everyone in Ohio can write that off on our taxes. Of the charity that we're giving them is finally good beer in uh, in Michigan from right here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Market Garden. I mean, basically the mayor and founder of West 25th right here is Sam McNulty. Uh, I, he doesn't like me pumping him up uh, the whole deal, but I'm going to do that for just a second and then I'll probably crap on him at some point. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, bright, uh, bright side, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Nano Bird, Brew. Bird of Paradise. Bird of Paradise. Um, and then we just, uh, this, this summer, launched two new concepts. Yeah. Uh, Clandestina. Mezcaleria, um, so it's a tequila mezcal bar. Yeah, um, with sexy Mexican street food. Oh, hey girl. Um, and then you can also buy. You can also get crispy worms there. So uh, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. Yeah, yeah, fried grasshoppers, which are they are really good. Don't knock them until you've tried. <laughs> exactly. Them. <laughs> yeah, they're like little chips, little crisps. Yeah. Um, and then about four weeks ago, um, coincidentally, Kira and I were down in Oaxaca, Mexico, doing mezcal research. Yeah. And while we were away, we opened up. Um, our latest uh, concept called Smoke and Mirrors. So it's a dance club and rum bar right below Clandestina. My goodness, It's man. super fun. So, I mean, full disclosure, Sam and I are pretty good friends. We've known each other for, for a long time and have, uh, you know, have seen what you've done in Northeast Ohio of like past and present and, you know, what you're going to be doing in the future. And, uh, you know, low key, I think that you are one of the most influential people in Northeast Ohio that maybe the nor- most normal person in Cleveland might not know about, I guess, essentially. I paid him to say that, by the way. Yeah, but no, but I mean, like, look around. I mean, it's just, I mean, the fact that, you know, when you took over, oh, we're going to get to this, I want to get the full story of, you know, taking over the the building that was originally uh, Beer Market mm-hmm. um, in on West 25th and, and building that over the last like 12, 15 years or whatever it's been. But, you know, I mean, we're talking about the whole rap sheet of, of everything that you do. I mean, what does your day typically look like and how do you keep everything running in line? Because running one restaurant is hard enough, let alone a full fledged brewery and five other restaurants slash nightclubs that, that you already have. Well, I usually start most days uh, by going on a podcast. So yeah, that's sure. Yeah. Like standard. Bam. You know, yeah. So we might have coffee. you on a few more times. <laughs> 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 no, it's funny. It's, it's, it's one of those 24 seven jobs where like, you know, we, we own our real estate. Yeah. Um, as well as we're our own tenants in, in those properties. So we're like my business partner, Mark and I are like real estate guys at heart. Okay. But we also love hospitality. We loved essentially light manufacturing, which brewing is. Sure. So we kind of have like wear multiple hats and um, we'll just say that like, there's never a dull moment. You might get a call at 4 a.m. Um, like last night, an alarm went off at 2 a.m. Really? And of course you gotta like stop what you're doing and handle it. So little things like that always come up. But right now we've got a team almost like just shy of 200 people. Mm. So we've got a lot of people on our team to help navigate the ship and uh, keep us going. Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people to have under mm-hmm. your leadership. I mean, so when you're bringing on people, I mean, what are some of the first things that, that you look for in an employee, especially right now when it's so hard to be able to hire people? It's getting a lot better, I will say yeah, that. Good. I'll start with that. But um, yeah, about a year ago, it was nearly impossible yeah. to you know, find anybody. But uh, the, the tides are turning I mean, in a very positive way. In, in your opinion, what what caused that? Because I'm looking around, being like, where are all these people? You know, the, these were filled jobs 
pre-pandemic and then we get three years later and it's like no one. I have, I have a lot of theories. Yeah, um, lay them out. This I, is not our podcast. Everybody, everybody's <laughs> asking that same question. Yeah. There's people saying, well, like, you know, some folks did leave the hospitality industry or they, they left whatever, whatever they, they were doing, they switched careers and so they're in a different world. Um, I think a lot of it was, like you've probably read about universal basic income and, and it's been this concept that's been bandied about in recent decades where like in some countries have tried it where everybody gets a, like a, a basic income to like sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the more they work, the more they, more input they give that they can make obviously more. Yeah. Um, essentially during the pandemic, it was a, it was a short term experiment. And what happens if everybody gets universal basic income? Yeah. And for a lot of people, it was enough to just enough to like, Get pay, by. Their, pay their bills, yeah. get by, and they just kind of were like, let's see what happens. And a lot of people just kind of wanted to coast. Sure. Um, and took time off. And um, I think now we're seeing people are like, hey, you know, they want to get back out and be meaningful and ha like live, live a little bit better now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and uh, throughout that time, you have, we, we've talked in that you have paid your employees well. So a lot of them, you didn't have a whole lot of turnover, at least at, at Market Garden. No, we, we were very fortunate. Our team's very loyal and we're loyal to them. Um, so we took really good care of them. And uh, I would say the vast majority when we were reopening, they all wanted to come back. Yeah. I, I think a lot of folks in the hospitality world, they're social creatures, they're social animals. I mean, we all are. Sure, yeah. Uh, well, we all should be, I should say. <laughs> um, but I think, the folks that are drawn to the hospitality world, they're, they're, they probably have a stronger pro proclivity to be around people, to be active and dynamic and, you know, in conversations. And um, so this world kind of, it, it wins you back in very quickly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's go back a little bit because I, I think it's one of the things that is that you've had such an impact here on Cleveland with is, you know, West 25th. Uh, mm -hmm. What was West 25th before you kind of discovered it before you put your fingerprints all over it um, and kind of on how you kind of found this neighborhood and how you got into it. So how much time do we have? Oh, we have plenty of time. <laughs> okay. so, once upon a time in a land far, far away. I was born a baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, um, so I, I quote unquote discovered it when my mom and dad would load seven kids into this rusty station wagon uh, in the Coventry neighborhood of Cleveland yeah. Heights. And we were dirt poor. Both my parents were social workers. Sure. Um, so not making enough money to like properly raise seven kids, <laughs> but somehow they made it work. <laughs> yeah. um, so we'd, we'd all pile into this rusty station wagon, drive from Coventry to the West Side Market, yeah. do our shopping. And I remember we're like asking my dad like, oh, can we like walk around? They're like, like do something else. And he was all like, nope, straight back to the car. We're sure. out of here. Yeah. So. Back in those days, and that was in the 1800s, <laughs> um, West 25th was largely boarded up, a lot of graffiti. There was like, it was just a sketchy, sketchy place to be. You definitely would not want to be there after dark. Sure. Um, fast forward um, years later, I'm an urban planning uh, major at Cleveland State University, just around the corner here, and loved the Ohio City neighborhood. And we, we actually studied at different points and because and, it has a lot of uh, it's got the dense walkability, yeah. a lot of great infrastructure, like the historic buildings, historic architecture. So it had a lot of potential and it had a few things, very strong things going for it, such as the West Side Market. Um, there were some institutions like the Cleveland Clinic, Lutheran Hospital, Ignatius uh, had a, like years ago, Ignatius considered leaving the neighborhood because it was so bad. Did they? Wow. Instead, they said, hey, we're going to double down and expand our campus and really like become part of this neighborhood and yeah. help it help yeah. it grow. So I'm in cl my urban planning classes at CSU and I'm looking at this neighborhood. I'm like, and then when I tra would travel to Europe, I would see neighborhoods that absolutely reminded me of Ohio City. Yeah. In fact, neighborhoods that were, in, you know, were the inspiration for the, the folks that came to Cleveland sure. and built out Ohio City. They, they were just doing what they saw back in, in Europe. So I, I decided to take an internship with what's now Ohio City Incorporated, so yeah. the, the local community development corporation. I'm 18 years old, wet behind the ears, just learning enough to be dangerous, not enough to be effective. Yeah. But I'm like, this neighborhood has so much potential. Um, and I, it, it planted the seed in my 18-year-old 
a uh, very young brain that I want at some point I wanted to do something in this neighborhood. I wasn't sure what it was. Yeah. Um, fast forward a few years later, I turned 21 studying abroad in Poland. Insert joke there. <laughs> <laughs> Kira, my wife Kira would tell you, you were studying a lot abroad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I turned 21 and realized I got to do something with my life. I'm yeah. 21 years old. That's sure. like old. Yeah. So I came back to Cleveland. Was back. Do you at, kind of feel that pressure? To, uh, it's like, all right, I got to do something. Strangely, I, I call it my like midlife crisis at 21. Yeah. I'm like, oh Quar my God. Quarter life crisis. I'm 20. Yeah. yeah. I'm 21 years old. Like I got to do something. So I was at, at the time I was um, involved with the student government at Cleveland State University. I was the urban studies college uh, senator. Okay. And then I, I ran for speaker of the Senate. So I represented um, the student body in faculty. I had meetings. such a politician on my hands. I know, right? <laughs> Jeez, my goodness. <laughs> Believe me, th that gave me enough of a taste for politics that I'm like, nope. Yeah, toodaloo. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, as a student, uh, the Speaker of the Senate, I'm sitting in a faculty meeting on campus and they're talking about all the different you know, agenda items. And the one agenda item was, we've got this uh, restaurant and bar on campus that I, I knew, but it, it was always going, like in my... This would have been my third year at Cleveland State. Yeah, I was a junior. Um, the, they would have operators in there for like six months, and then oh. they'd go out of business, and then another one would come in. And So they're like, we're, we're putting out an RFP for this space called the Shire. And I'm like, I know what RFP stands for because I took a proposal writing class last, last quarter. Um, so I'm like, I know how to write a proposal. So let me yeah. write a proposal for this and see what happens. For, for the class, if <laughs> someone doesn't know what RFP doesn't stand for, what do we got? Request for proposal. Wow. Yeah. Oh um, so I wrote the RFP, submitted it, and uh, lo and behold, I was selected. And I had about three months, it might have been, I think it was two and a half months to renovate the space yeah. and open a restaurant. Now, mind you, I had zero clue. Yeah. I had never worked in a restaurant. We were so poor, we rarely went to restaurants. I wasn't even like... I had a familiarity from like being on the other side of the table. Sure. Um, but spent a lot of time in the library, read everything I could, did a lot of the construction work myself and opened a restaurant. Look at you go. I mean, so like 21 years old, I mean, how much, I mean, did, did, you couldn't have had that much money at the time or like, did you go out and get loans? How, how did this go about? So when I turned 11, uh, my birthday present uh, for my parents was four paper routes. <laughs> <laughs> The New York the Times. The gift that keeps on yeah. giving. I heard, like, my, my parents were like, oh, we have a gift for you. I was like, oh, cool. We never get gifts because we're poor. Sure. And I was like, cool. What, like, what is it? They're like, newspaper routes. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I don't really know. Like, how is that a gift? Did you already have a bike? Yes. Okay, so you knew how to ride a bike. That's good. Yeah, you didn't have to like run the paper route. So they're like, for the next 10 years of your life, you're going to wake up at 4 a.m., oh 365 gosh. days a year, rain or shine and walk around the neighborhood throwing newspapers. So I, I delivered the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Plain Dealer, and the Sun Press. What was your initial <clears throat> reaction to that? Like, did you not know better or were you pissed at the time? I didn't really know better. And I was just kind of like, I, I sometimes can be slow to react. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kind of like, let me process this <laughs> yeah. for a second. Uh, and, this, <laughs> is, this is like the worst trade ever. <laughs> we'll, we'll just say, I, my parents years later told me that I cried the first few weeks like every so often they would, my dad would go to wake me up at 4 a.m and I, he was like you'd start to cry like i don't want to go yeah, i agree i mean right now it's you know uh 20 degrees in in cleveland and that's because it's uh you know 10 30 in the morning but you know for a for a kid to go out jacket i mean mm -hmm. throwing it i mean in the the winter cleveland winters that's pretty rough but i tell you what it it taught me a work ethic yeah discipline um it turned me i was never a morning person it turned me into a morning person yeah um and to answer your question about how how did i fund that first restaurant <clears throat> so i would deliver newspapers in the morning school during the day and then in the evenings i would we were, we were hustlers because we kind of had to be my mom was a, a refugee from lithuania so she had this idea that like the U.S. was this land of milk and honey. All you had to do was hustle. Sure. So she encouraged us to go out and like, hey, grab a, grab a rake and go knock on doors and offer, you know, neighbors and say like, hey, I'll, I'll rake your lawn for 20 bucks. Yeah. So if you can, if you can rake that lawn in 30 minutes, you just made 40 bucks an hour. So you were just brought up with this entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. Because it sounded like you kind of had to be. By, out of necessity. But yeah. it, it, 
I, I'm actually, it changed your life. It, it shaped you. I'm very thankful for it. I, I always say like the best thing my parents gave me was nothing. Yeah. Like they gave me love and, and you know, taught me things and showed me like morals and ethics and fed me, housed me, of course. Yeah. But they, there was no like, here's your, you know, tuitions paid, this yeah. and that. There, it was like you had to work for what you got. It was a can and a can do attitude. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I should have brought a can of beer, but that's another story. Yeah, Sam McNulty doesn't go anywhere, really, with that, <laughs> at least a six-pack of beer to bring you. Uh, and he shows up and goes, man, I just forgot that I didn't bring bring any beer. I was going to bring the Festivus Mix Pack for us to uh, we'll, we'll talk get, about. We'll, we'll make sure we, we plug that at some point. But, yeah, so the paper route, you had enough money saved up that you could then yeah, from, put a down payment for the restaurant? For delivering newspapers in the morning, working, like, like kind of hustling in the evenings. Um, and I did some like, like, like contracting. I would shovel snow. Um, I spent, at one point, I spent two months uh, digging out a foundation of a huge house in Cleveland wow. Heights. Um, that, was a, that was a lesson learned. And I, they, they were like, do you want to get paid by the job or by the hour? I'm thinking to myself, hmm, let's go by the job. So yeah. I, I threw out this huge number. They're like, deal. And then I spent the next, like, so many weeks yes. breaking my back. For free probably made like a dollar an hour. <laughs> so I learned a lesson. Yeah. In, in manual labor, take the hourly take the rate. Hourly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so I had saved up some money and maxed out some credit cards mm -hmm. and opened up a restaurant called Cafe 101, had it for eight years on campus, finished up my undergrad, got most of a master's degree, um, never did finish. Um, and then I think this was your master's degree. Yeah, running. I oh, mean, I, I literally learned, running a restaurant. I learned more running the, the business. Yeah. than I did in any class for sure. sure. Um, and then there's a long story there, but uh, Aramark was a food service provider at the time, and they basically forced us out. Okay, it was, it was actually interesting. There were student protests. We were on the news every night. It was kind of a, kind of a fun time. Yeah. And so I closed that. We should go back and see if we can find some archive video of that. We'd have to dig. Oh my gosh. Like what year is this around? This would have been, so uh, what, I was 21, I see, did that. 95 I opened. Yeah. So it's been like 2003. Okay. So eight years, yeah. Na 95 I was in uh, preschool. <laughs> Thanks, Austin. <laughs> I don't feel old at all. He's going to punch me in the face. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, moving on, moving on. Uh, but uh, so... You get forced out, and mm -hmm. then you're kind of forced, obviously, to go somewhere else. And that's when you, is that when you found Ohio City? Yeah, so I, I, I had been, while I was running the restaurant for those years, I was buying houses and apartment buildings and renovating them in the summers and then renting them out. So, so, I, so you just never stopped. I just loved what I did and yeah. just, you know, didn't have a ton of hobbies besides work. Yeah. And maybe having a beer here or there. Yeah, <laughs> you're not known to do that, no. Um, so about what age are you right now? So I would have been, I was 29. And so I took two years and did, um, it might have been like about a year actually, and just focused on the real estate. Sure. But like I, like I mentioned, if, if you're in hospitality and you're drawn to it, it, it just, it's like that mafia movie where you try to leave and it, they just, it pulls Sucks you right back in. Pulls you right back yeah. in. And I just like, I kind of miss the, the fast pace and the excitement and the thrill of, of, the restaurant business. Yeah. So a, a good friend of mine, Mark Primer, he and I were talking about doing some projects together. And I was like, what do you think about like looking at Ohio city? I think there's a ton of opportunity there. And he, he comes from a real estate development background and he's a really smart, just visionary guy. So the two of us were just walking the streets of Ohio city, looking at properties, kicking tires. And um, we ended up buying uh, the property that's now beer market. Yeah. And I'm sorry, was beer market. Yeah, now, now Brightside, Brightside and, yeah. and uh, Bird of Paradise. But so we, uh, we bought that. And I remember calling my mom that night and, and dad and saying like, oh, like, hey, exciting news. I, I bought a property in Ohio City. We're going to open up this Belgian beer bar. My mom started crying. <laughs> She's like, you're going to get murdered. Because <laughs> she remembered taking you guys on mm -hmm. to the West Side Market right there. Yeah. And then she tells a story that I hadn't known until I, after I purchased the, the property. She said when my older brother would have been like, I think he was like a, two years old and I was just born, my parents went down to the department store that was in that building. The, the department store was called Freeze and Sheely. That was in the beer market building? Yes. Wow. It was like a, a five-story building with, yeah. with a sales department in the basement that's now Bird of Paradise Dance Club. So 
when, when that uh, department store was going out of business in the early 70s, um, they went there for the going out of business sale and bought a bunch of like bedding and like baby clothes and stuff Wild. from the going out of business sale. So when they, when they first walked through the space with me, they were like, oh my gosh, and this was over here and this sure. was over there. So it was kind of a fun throwback. So that would have been. That has to mean a lot to you, though, you know, to, uh, for, for really memories did. and yeah. you know, going around that neighborhood as a kid. But then also, I mean, that's wild that your parents were in the same building. Yeah. This is your first kind of big, big restaurant. Yeah. So it was just it was super cool. And honestly, like it, it took them a minute to come around to Ohio City. And the idea that you could actually like make a living there and, and do well. Um, but very quickly, they were they loved visiting. They'd hit the market. They'd come to, to beer market, Barcento. Even one time, they went to the Speakeasy Dance Club. And yeah, it was awesome to see my at the time late seventies father like <laughs> like walking around a nightclub. Like, ooh, this is cool. This is cool. Was he busting him over a little bit? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. So, in you know, in this time, you know, you've kind of gone through your twenties and just kind of worked, 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 worked. You open up beer. Uh, Barcento and beer market. And that was about 12 years ago or was it 15 years ago? This would have been, so we opened beer market in 2005. Okay. Oh yeah. Much, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Like 18 years, 18 years 18 ago. Years ago? Yeah. 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 Okay. And then you, you get this idea. Did, were you brewing beer at the time? Or were you just like, you know, importing no. and kind of moving on? So we were, we were just, we were just a bar, no food. Yeah. Um, and it, our focus was Belgian beers. Yeah. Um, and then we had, a uh, small craft lo local craft beer selection in the, uh, and business was gangbusters. So we, two years after beer market opened, we opened Barcento next door. So the Italian restaurant and wine bar. And two years after that, we opened speakeasy, the dance club downstairs. Yeah. Um, and then two years after that, so this, the building across the street, what's now market garden mm -hmm. brew pub had sat vacant for 15 years. So, We'd sit on the patio at Beer Market on nice summer evenings, and I'd look across the street, and I'm like, how is this building right next door to the West Side Market, boarded up, sprayed with graffiti, and just sitting empty? Yeah. It just seemed like a travesty. So it took, took me about 10 years of cajoling, but I eventually convinced the owner uh, to sell it. How long did it take you? Uh, about 10 years. Wow. And wow. we would, uh, it was three brothers, two of whom were doing... A uh, hard time for kidnapping, hmm. food stamp fraud, and yeah. check kiting. It seems like some good guys. Yeah. <laughs> so the brother that was not in jail, he was the one I could like, you know, sit with and talk. And uh, we, we just bonded over the. You were doing like conjugal visits to the jail. To <laughs> no, I thought about it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, and you know, this, everyone kind of knows the story now. If you know, if you've just continued to build your little empire there in, in the corner of, you know, in, in Ohio city mm -hmm. on West 25th. And, but I, I think it's so interesting too, is that a lot of this is you've had all the success. You've kind of continued to build and build and build these restaurants and you've done it with your, your partner market. You know, how have you continued to maybe keep egos out of this and continue to not just be good business partners, but be really, really good friends. Yeah. It's a great question. It's we, we've been business partners, 20 years, I want to say. Yeah. And friends, I don't know how long before that, so quite some time. Um, yeah. And we still like each other, still hang out. Still, yeah. We, we go, we travel together on occasion. Uh, our wives are very close friends. Yeah. Um, so most of it is, I realized Mark's usually right. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that how you no, figured no, it out? Kidding. Yeah. But no, we're, we're really good about like, we talk everything through and we, we try to leave, check our egos at the door. And there's times when like he feels really strongly about a decision and I'm like, Hey, I don't think that's the right way to go, but let's try it. Yeah. And most decisions in life you can adjust and tweak. Sure. like almost nothing is like you do it like it's set, set, in stone. set in stone. Yeah. Right. So then there's times when I feel strongly about something and, and I, I, I get to drive for that, sure. that decision. So we just kind of like take turns, but truly he is the smarter of the two of us. So he, Usually he's the one when if he feels strongly about something, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to trust your judgment, Mark. And usually that's the right decision. Sure. Sure. <laughs> and, and it's what has been the most fun part for you to um, over that past 18 years that you've been on West 25th, because I mean, it, it has become the, I mean, it, it has really helped build Ohio city. The, one of the things that, that you always say is what high tides raise all ships, which I think the, is the rising tide lifts all ships, rising yeah. tides 
lifts all ships. Mm -hmm. I can never get that <laughs> phrase right. I think I, I think I've spat it out a few a few times. But um, but that that's really kind of been your mantra. And I know that you've tried you've helped bring other businesses mm -hmm. in, in that area. I think a lot of people, um, a lot of business owners, might be arguably in selfishly minded or closed minded. Maybe those aren't the right words, but don't want competition. They want competition to say, "Well, you welcome it." Yeah. So it, that kind of harkens back to my my background in city planning. Mm -hmm. Um, like I could go out to Avon Lake, open up a standalone business on a like boring stretch of commercial, like vapid sure. commercial like activity. Or I, I, in my case, I wanted to work and grow businesses and live somewhere that I, I found dynamic and interesting. Yeah. So like Ohio city wouldn't be a neighborhood that most bankers 20 years ago would have been like, this is a great opportunity. Like, sure. Nobody wanted to lend down there. I mean, it was, it was desolate. It was sketchy. Um, so it was much, a much higher risk, mm -hmm. but 20 years ago, the properties were so undervalued. You could buy, you could buy a commercial property for what you would pay for a single family house. Now, can I ask you how much you paid for beer market in oh, Barcento? It is public record. So oh. <laughs> I guess I'm not really hiding anything here. It was over or under two hundred thousand. Over. Okay. Below four. Okay. <laughs> I think that's, it was like three eighty, if that's I recall. Absurd. Yeah. That is absurd. Um, and like even with that, um, it was still a bit, at the time it was three eighty is a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but for what we were getting, that's a very large space in a gorgeous, yeah, historic. But it's uh, also an investment too, and that investment yeah, is paid off for sure. Um, but. Uh, yeah, Ohio. So, what were, what were we talking about? I missed I just the, the excitement that, that you see right now with with West Twenty oh, Fifth, and just kind of you know the, how much it's grown. And um, I mean, it is. I mean, it's great to see what, what what's been taking place yeah. down there. And it wouldn't be Cleveland without West Twenty Fifth. Rising tide conversation. Yeah. So that was that was something again going back into my city planning background, and then like and honestly, when I say city planning, a lot of it was travel all over the world. Yeah. And seeing how other cities, you know, looked and operated and different kind of ways of life. So everywhere from the Middle East to Europe, to South America, to North America, um, there's just so many different ways to like craft a neighborhood. And some of the most interesting ones, like, so what, one of the, the big tenets of, of city planning is you want the highest amount of choice in the smallest amount of area. Sure. So again, not to knock Avon Lake, but that would be the opposite of that, where it's like <laughs> going after Avon. Lake. You just you, like everything's like a mile apart. No, yeah, nobody can walk to anything. Sure, they're always in their cars. So Ohio City was the opposite of that. Like it's dense, urban, walkable, um, diverse. So it had all these things going for it, and it just was honestly, it was exciting to be down there every day. Yeah, uh, I I tell this story. I rented a tiny studio apartment. Um, next door to beer market so yeah. I could finish off the construction because I was down there 24 seven. Like I didn't want to go back to Cleveland Heights to my house. I had to drive back and forth every day. So I was like six month lease. I'll finish off the construction, get the bar open and then I'll move back to Cleveland Heights. Um, so almost 15 years later, I, I had been on month to, a month to month lease for 14 and a half years. I, I finally moved out. A month to month lease. <laughs> for over 14 years. Were you just like every month with a guy calling, be like, you want to do this again? He's like, do you, you want to do at least three months? Like six months? Like, no, I'm gonna, I think I'm, this is the month. Commit, I, you know, I might be slightly commitment averse. Yeah. I, I do love this. Can, can we go on record and tell the story about you, you uh, hitting the guy with water balloons from, <laughs> from up there? <laughs> Which which one? Which one? <laughs> well, tell me one of them. <laughs> so we we had story um, time with Sam. We we yeah. It was in the early days, especially. It was, it was it was a place where, like, we were building a neighborhood. Yeah. But I would say, eighty percent of the properties were vacant and boarded up. Um, There's a lot of drug dealing activity. There was prostitution. It was just, it was kind of, it was pretty sketchy. So yeah. we kind of had this. <clears throat> I don't want to say siege mentality, but it might've been a little bit of that where we, we had to like keep, you know, protect our patrons on their way to their cars or whatever, back to their your houses in the neighborhood. So every once in a while, we, we had a few techniques we would use with really aggressive uh, folks. Sure. And it all, nobody was harmed. Yeah. Um, but we, we had, we had an air horn. Yeah. That if, if, some, <laughs> if someone, like, you know, someone would just like start pounding on the door or whatever. So we would just like, 
open the door crack and blast the air horn. It was kind of like a sign, like, hey, like, time to move on. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Tutaloo. Well, I mean, at least, you know, you kept it to water balloons, you kept it to air horns. Mm -hmm. That's good, you know. It's, that's not, no harm, no foul, <laughs> you know. But, you know, now we're looking in, into the future right now with, uh, with with Cleveland, and, you know, there's there's a lot of exciting things, to, I mean, things to be excited about, especially the Irish Town Bend. I mean, and you're semi-involved in that. Oh, can, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, well, I mean d definitely involved in it. I don't mean to, you know, well, I'm, that I'm you're not doing. scraping the soil away right yeah. now, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, th well, things like that are such an opportunity for, for Cleveland to, you know, it's, you know, being from outside of Cleveland, I heard the national narrative about it. And it's mm -hmm. like, ah, uh, you know, it's, you know, kind of a crap hole. And, you know, there's really no opportunity. I had people when I moved here being like, you know, things catch on fire there and the Browns are really <laughs> bad. And I'm just like, Okay, I guess I'll find out for myself. And I'm like, what godforsaken land am I moving to? Uh, but it turns out, I, mean, I, I love Cleveland. I have been here for six years. I met my wife here. I got married here. All my friends. It was like one of the coolest things about my, my wedding was that so many people from out of town came here and they're like, Cleveland's awesome. Oh, you mean the wedding you never invited me to? Oh, shut up. You were invited to my wedding. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You were invited to my wedding. I go to, okay, so here's a little story time for you. I... <laughs> I, I, I mail you the card. Yeah. It got returned. Okay. You were already out of town. We had talked about it. Uh, you were going to be in a different country. I think, I think we were in Croatia, if I recall. I, th I thought you were in uh, uh, Ireland. Is that what I told you? I don't know. You were, you were somewhere. <laughs> maybe you were, you were probably just hiding up in your single apartment on, on West 25th that you've been paying for month to month, the past decade and a half. Uh, but... And then I was like, so it gets returned, and I was like, okay, well, I know they're not coming, but I still want them to have the invite. And then I go to his, his house, and I there was no mailbox. Or and, doorbell. Or doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> no mailbox, no doorbell. I'm like, and there was like no place to like put it underneath the door. So I'm like, <laughs> what do you want me to do? And so I told him, I was like, hey, like I was at your house. I tried to deliver you the, the invite. Technically, you did not receive an invitation <laughs> because your home your layout would not allow me to. You were invited. I did. I did mention siege mentality, right? I, yeah, right. Yeah. What do you want me to do? Blast on your door, dude? Come on, man. Uh, anyways, yes. Uh, but that was like one of the cool things about the wedding is that so many people came from out of town um, and saw this city that I've now fallen in love mm -hmm. with because of, you know, all of the great restaurants, all of the great things that you can do around here, you know? Cleveland is like flying under the radar still. Yeah. And the narrative has definitely changed on the national uh, stage. Yeah. But there's still a perception of Cleveland. Like, again, m most friends, like you're saying, most friends, when they come here for the first time from overseas or other parts of the country, they are blown away. They're like, A, nobody thinks of Cleveland as a waterfront city. Exactly. Um, which, is, which is also interesting. Nobody thinks also of Ohio City as a riverfront neighborhood. Oh yeah, and Irish Town Bend's going to change that. That is true. So yeah. Irish Town Bend is is creating this connective tissue, public green space that's going to like bridge the gap between Ohio City and and the river that it sits on. Because yeah. right now there's there's really no way to like get to the river that that you're not like scratching your left ear with your right hand. There there really is, and you'd have to cross the bridge. Um, you know what what is that Columbus? Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of go down. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's it's just, there's no, that's connection. technically not Ohio city. That's right. the flats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, Irish town bend this, this huge, was it 17 acre park um, that, that c runs between West 25th street and the Cuyahoga river um, is going to be a game changer. And yeah. what's, what's fascinating is like, not to sound like an old fogey 20 years ago in, <laughs> in my day, back in my day, <laughs> we were, we, our battles were like picking up litter, um, painting over graffiti and reducing crime. Um, and granted the, the crime, when I'm talking about it was, it was car break-ins. It was just like property, uh, crime. It wasn't like violent things. Sure. Yeah. But in the early days it was like, it was like the block and tackling of like stabilizing a neighborhood and then encouraging other businesses to open up. So like Mike and Pete Mitchell's of Mitchell's ice cream, yeah, two wonderful human beings that I went to Cleveland Heights high with. Um, I always joke around. They they used to beat me up for my lunch money. Did they actually? <laughs> no. Oh, <laughs> I was like, they're like the nicest the guys. The nicest guys. <laughs> I, but I love telling that because like, then people are like, wait, I know them. There's no way on earth. Yeah, yeah. Just stick with it. Just be like, absolutely. They were a bunch of shysters. <laughs> 
but like you know, we, we encouraged, we worked with like other business people and said like, and basically said, Hey, like come join us in Ohio city yeah. and be part of this Renaissance. Um, and we couldn't have done it without them. Like at a certain point we had our hands full with our, all our different concepts and properties. Um, so bringing people like Mitchell's, um, I, like Molly who owns uh, Soho also mm -hmm. went to Cleveland Heights high with her. So there's just a lot of like great people on the street, like the Conway brothers are doing great things at great lakes. Yeah. Um, Karen small, uh, over at, at, um, Pearl street wine bar, the old flying fig space. And then you have like, you know, more recent, uh, folks that have come and joined us like Morgan Yagi at Bartleby. Totally. Um, and of course I, I got to throw a shout out to Dan Whalen, who he was a colleague of mine. And he was on the opening bartending team at Nano Brew. Was he really back in two thousand eleven? That wow! And uh, I, I, I joke around with him. Like I taught him everything he knows, <laughs> and he used all the money he made bartending at Nano Brew to build Intro. Yeah, the giant mixed use uh, building. It is beautiful. At the corner of Lorraine and Twenty Fifth. It is gorgeous. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's now in, in the hospitality world. He owns Etta, the coffee shop on the corner. Yeah, uh, Jaja and. Um, Pioneer. What you should have done back in the day is like not, or you, you should have just like bought like 10% of his brain and then you get 10% of his ideas. That means you get 10% of his income. So that means anything that he comes up with. I like the way you think. How about that? Yeah, instead of like paying him. Yeah. You know, some, there's some, there's an idea in there. Uh, but you know, now we're looking right now at <clears throat> staying in Ohio city, I guess, which, um, there, there's a, Westside market, new executive director that's put mm -hmm. in place as of yesterday, right? Yeah, As of yesterday, remind me her name. Uh, it's going to come to me. I've, yeah. ne I've actually never, never met her. Oh, okay. But yeah. there is a but lot. Je Jennifer, um, Jessica Trevisano yeah. was the uh, chief strategist that Mayor Bibb brought in to, uh, to, to kind of reposition the market and prep it for this really interesting move. So 30, 30 some years ago when I was at Ohio City Incorporated, incorporated as an intern, 30 years ago, they were talking about creating a nonprofit to manage the market. Oh, th we've Think been having the that. same conversation for 30 same years. Same conversation for 30 years. Oh my gosh. Thankfully under Mayor Bibb's watch, yeah. he was effective in getting it done. So yeah. it, like kudos to, to Mayor and, Bibb. In a relatively short time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was like a seismic shift to, to make that move because you had to go through the whole public process and a lot of people had opinions on it, not least of which the vendors who make the market what it is. Um, but that, that, that transition's about to happen. Uh, it's in progress. David Abbott, who uh, led Gun Foundation for years, is the chair of the Westside Market Board. Mm -hmm. So you've got a brilliant leader like overseeing it. And I, I, I really have a ton of optimism for the Westside Market. I always describe it as like, it's kind of like the, the center of, of the universe, yeah. the Ohio City universe. Like we kind of orbit around it. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous building. You bring out of town friends <laughs> and family to the West side market. They're like their jaws on the floor. Yeah. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's a gorgeous space. You feel like you're in a train station in Europe somewhere. It's yeah, just, honestly. Yeah. It's, it's outstanding. Um, so it, it's, and it's also a huge traffic generator. Like nobody knows exactly how many people go there. Cause we don't like the city hasn't monitored in years, like the, the foot traffic, but the estimates are about 3 really? million people. Yeah. How do they, I mean, are they pulling that number out of their butt? Like, at one point there were um, people counters, like these like infrared um, wall mounted uh, scanners. Yeah. Um, this is when Amanda Dempsey was the uh, market general manager. Okay. And at the time they estimated about 3 million, I'm sorry, 2 million, but it's definitely grown from there. I mean, it really is like the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest if you're doing a SWOT analysis, it really is one of the biggest opportunities in yeah. Cleveland. I mean, in Northeast Ohio. It's tremendous. Um, and it's, it's been undervalued, undermarketed. Um, it's just like not enough people. Like it, it's, it's a great place. Like right now it feels like the place you want to bring tourists in, but not enough people think of it as their, like, their local grocery store yeah. um, where you can get really interesting stuff, talk to your vendor, talk to like, it's, it's just, it's a very, the experience at the West Side Market. Mm -hmm. Like to me is like, I go there just to wander around and end up leaving with a bag full of like interesting food. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really special place. So that that's kind of like, you know, it's this institution 
a public market, not enough, like not a lot of cities have, like they might have a public market that's just in an old like warehouse building. Sure. We've got this gorgeous piece of historic architecture that, that adds to the experience. And then we're building out the neighborhood around it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really dynamic. Uh, like places like Intro, what Graham Vasey has done and Marika uh, over on West 29th, like they're creating a whole interesting note over there. Uh, so I'm, I'm really optimistic for the neighborhood's future. Yeah. Uh, you know, looking outside of the neighborhood, looking, you know, 20 years in the future, what do you think people will be saying about Cleveland then? Good question. Um, so I, I'm guessing in 20 years, the word will be out. Like yeah. right now it's getting out. Like, so when I was growing up, all my friends were like, couldn't wait to get out of sure. the city. They were like, they, I'm going to go to Ohio State. I'm going to stay in Columbus. Yeah. I'm moving to Chicago to go to... Go to you did everything you possibly could to stay in Cleveland. I, I, yeah. yeah. By, by hook and crook. I like, and what's funny is the more I traveled, the more I appreciated Cleveland. Yeah. So I, I grew up in a traveling family. We loved, you know, just seeing the world at any chance we got. And I w the more I went to other places, the more I'd come back and say, oh my gosh, like Cleveland is amazing. It's, it's, and it's got tons of opportunity that's untapped. Yeah. Um, so in my, like now all the, like in, it started happening about 10 years after I graduated high school. A lot of my friends who had lived in other places, studied elsewhere, um, they were coming back for holidays and they're like, what's going on? Like there's something happening in Cleveland. Like the downtown had, had pretty much, you know, 20 years ago the downtown was like empty after, after the nine to five shift. Um, Ohio City was derelict. Then they started to see all this interesting stuff happen. It was dynamic. And like if you grew up in Solon, let's say, like yeah. she, my, my wife Kira did, she wanted to get the F out of Solon. Yeah. And by proxy, she also wanted to get out of Cleveland. Okay. When she moved back from most recently Ireland, um, she was like, oh my gosh, Cleveland's cool. Like there's things happening again in the city. And it was, she could picture her living a great life here. So she decided to stay. Totally. So I, I think that's happening. I know that's happening more and more. In 20 years, I think it's, we're, we're going to probably be at a point where we're trying to keep people out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not in a bad way, but we're probably going to be like right but that, now. But that's what they're doing in Austin mm -hmm. right now. I don't know if Cleveland will ever get to the point of being Austin, mainly just because of, I wouldn't want us to be. No, and I no, yeah. no, nor would I want it to be. Um, but or I, I think the weather has a, something a little bit to do with that, where just some people do not want to move to a, a cold weather city. Toronto would beg to differ. Oh, oh that's, that's a good point, yeah. And, and Chicago. And, and Cleveland has the, well, people are leaving Chicago in, in droves at this point, but the, the Cleveland infrastructure does have the capabilities to hold, like, I think it's 1.5 million people? I know, it, it was- it's, it's around a million. We built, the city was built to have a lot more population in the city proper than it does, yeah. there's no doubt. Yeah. Um, which, which creates a lot of opportunity. Like I love the, have uh, read about the, this midway project where they're taking superior Avenue is like five miles wide yeah, unnecessarily. And it's all this pavement. And it's just like, it feels like a, like, like no man's land. Well, the city is at, after years of working on it is finally breaking ground very soon, taking the middle two lanes and turning it into like a landscape bike hike trail, Yeah, which is that's visionary. That's, that's going to be awesome. That's what cities all over the world are doing with excess road roadway. So to see Cleveland jumping on that bandwagon in a very forward minded way is really good to see. And jumping on the kind of the, what they're calling the, the front porch of Cleveland being the, um, by the Sherwin Williams building, that area where they're yeah. doing, where they're starting to develop things like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, Cleveland's, Cleveland's got it happening. So which, which I'm excited about, I'm excited to be here, you know, setting roots up here. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I looked around, I was like, I don't want to leave. Yeah. You know, I like it here. You know, 100%. It's, it's fantastic. The, the only people that I still hear complaining about Cleveland are the folks that don't have passports. Sure. What do you mean? Like they don't travel. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like, they have this myopic view of like the, the city. I thought in. you meant the brewery passport. Shout out destination. <laughs> <laughs> also true. Yeah, Also true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a hot take. <laughs> but no, if, if, if you've never traveled and seen other parts of the world, um, you, you know, the grass is always going to feel like it's greener on the yeah. other side of the fence, right? Absolutely. Um, again, the more I travel, the more I love Cleveland. Yeah. Like every time that plane comes in to land at Cleveland Hopkins, I'm like, sweet. Let's rock also, and roll. get on the, the, the red line rapid train. Yeah. And 15 minutes later, I'm 
literally across the street from my house. Yeah. And not, not many cities would you be able to do that. No, not at all. And what, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to bring this up. I was going to segue this. Sam, like, loosely doesn't believe in cars. Um, you, like, never, <laughs> like, I, the first time I ever saw you in a car or saw your car was you were, we, we did the Johnny Appleseed Festival, the donut eating contest oh my together. Gosh, yes. And you had to, cause we were like a mile away, but how'd you get here? Did you drive today or did you, uh, what's did, funny, did you scooter today? I was gonna, I was gonna ride my bicycle. Yeah. Um, but then I had to pick up paint. Okay. Um, we're doing some, some remodeling. So you drove today? So I did drive. Wow. I, I dusted off my car keys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like my, my wife and I, Kira, um, we live in Duck Island. Yeah. So like a one block from Ohio city. Um, so we walk everywhere, bicycle when it's a little bit farther. We do have a scooter. Yeah. That's our like f favorite means of motorized transportation. <laughs> and then every once in a blue moon, like usually, and usually it's a visit her parents or my mom. Yeah. Um, we do get in a car. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's rare for us too. Now, is it because you don't necessarily like it? Do you want to be more, thinking of like the, you know, the emissions and things like that, or is it just because it's just, that's how you want to be? Uh, a little D, bit of everything. Yeah. All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. like, it's, it's, I think first and foremost, I just find it way more fun to walk and bicycle. Like I love, yeah. I love if, even in winter people say like, well, Oh my gosh, how do you ride a bicycle in winter? I'm like, well, do you ski? It's the same thing. Like you're, you're creating body heats by movement. And as long as you have enough, like the right gear, yeah. um, like the old adage, there is no bad weather. There's only bad clothing. Totally. Or not enough. <laughs> or not enough. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So love walking, love bicycling. Also, it's a sneaky way to work in exercise in your daily routine. Sure. Uh, versus like, I find sitting in a car to be like enervating. Yeah. Um, and in traffic, stressful. It is. So it's like, not only are you like sedentary, but you're also like stressed by like traffic and you know, pollution and whatever. And honestly, it just feels good to be living a lifestyle that I, I would see in like places all over the world where folks don't need cars as much. Um, one of my favorite things too is that um, Sam's wife, Kiera, I mean, lovely lady, one of my favorite people. Bad, uh, bad taste in men though. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, horrible taste in men. <laughs> um, but like, we met you guys at a, at a gala uh, at First Energy Stadium. And in the spring, it was the um, my multiple. Not it was uh, oh the one you were MC. The Le Leukia, Leukemia Lymphoma yeah. Society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought you, when you. I thought you said we first met. I was like, huh? No, 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 not that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we uh, that was you know in the summer. It was like spring. It wasn't that warm yeah. outside. And here comes Kira dressed to the nines and brought her scooter helmet and was like, <laughs> "We're here." I think that was bicycle. That was bicycle. We rode our bicycles. Oh my goodness. She was in heels. Jeez. For the uh, for the event, I had my sports coat on, which my, my weddings and funerals jacket. Yeah, do you, how, do you know, how many sport coats are you on? Uh, what, well, one that I'm allowed to wear. When, <laughs> do you when, have other ones that? When I met Kira, I had my universal um, sports coat. Yeah, was from U the old Unique Thrift Store, which was a a great thrift store where the Planet Fitness is now on Lorraine. Yeah, it used oh, yeah. to be a giant thrift store, and it was really? awesome. So I one day I was in there. Um, found a sports coat that fit. It was wool, beautifully made. It, maybe the cut was slightly out of style. I don't know, but sure. like, every 20 years it'll be back in style. Yeah. So yeah, just wait, wait it out. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a charcoal gray pinstripe. And uh, when Kira and I first met, I wore it to like a wedding or something. And she was like, I'm going to buy you a sports coat. I was like, no, no, I'm good. This, this one's yeah. served me well for all these years. She's like, no, no, this isn't a debate. <laughs> now, if you had to choose, would you still wear the old one? Uh, only because it fits so well and <laughs> I don't care if it gets like stuff spilled on it. Sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, looking big picture here, or actually, you know, I just kind of want to get into a few quick hitters here. What's the most underrated place in Cleveland that, or restaurant that people might not know about? And you can't say your own. I know that, but I, I'm asking you this because I know that you're a big proponent of other people's. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, Great question. Uh, Thank you. It's, I can pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's almost like you've done this before. Well, once in a while. Um, two places come to mind, uh, both ethnic, one's closer. Um, so Szechuan Gourmet, yeah. 36 and pain. In my opinion, best. I, I love spicy food. I love ethnic food. Um, 
amazing. So 36 yeah. in pain, it's right next to Tinkhole Market. So you can hit the, the grocery store for like random, like um, all kinds of Asian grocery items. Um, and just fun wandering, just like seeing stuff you've never seen before and like what, and trying it. Yeah. Um, I think just it's called Asia Town, right? In, mm -hmm. in Cleveland, that's yeah. the most underrated area yeah. in Cleveland. You know, I never like think to go there, unfortunately. It, it, and, and I think I'll, I'll posit this. The reason why is there's, there's no there there. Yeah. Like there's a lot of different cool spots. It's not like on one block. Right. It's like kind of scattered a little bit. So if, if I could you know, in my smush it in, smush it all in, like put your arms around it and squeeze, like, sh like take all these like hundred restaurants or whatever there are and put them all in like a, a, a central node, it would be awesome. Yeah. But right now there's like, you have one here, then three blocks down, there's another one and yeah. everything in between is empty. So it's, a lot of what we're doing in Ohio City is just merely just creating connections mm -hmm. and adding density. Yeah. So that Asia Town would benefit like wildly from that. Yeah. Um, before we get, I forgot that we want to talk about the the Festivus uh, oh, yeah, yeah. thing. So let's talk about that. You guys came up with this great idea of the, it, uh, you talk about it. So, so it's like a box of all the beers of, of with Market Garden. I, That's as elegant as I'm going to get, elegant about as I'm going to get. If Jerry Seinfeld is listening, <laughs> <laughs> apologies for... Uh, 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 stealing this idea, but I'll, I'll call it an homage. Has there been any legal ramifications from taking Festivus? You know, he, he keeps calling me, but I'm just dodging his calls. <laughs> just dodging Jerry that Seinfeld's calls. That call. was Jerry that was calling me, <laughs> yeah. in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> no, so so we, so we every brewery on the planet has a Christmas sale. Yeah. Um, most of the time, in my opinion, they're too sweet. They're overly spiced. They're kind of cloying, yeah. cloyingly sweet. So where you have one and you're like, I'm good. Yeah. I feel like I need to go brush my teeth and then have- You guys do have a lighter one, which is which is refreshing. So we, when when everybody was zigging, we decided to zag. Yeah. So we said, ours is gonna be dry. So I have a nice, clean, dry finish. And uh, the, it is spiced, um, but it's mi like mildly spiced. So it's gentle, like it's not like a punch in the mouth yep. with a- um, potpourri yeah sure sure yeah <laughs> if, if you can kind of picture that but um so and then then we said well we don't want to like follow suit and have our own like this is our christmas ale so we said what about calling it festivus yeah so festivus for the rest of us absolutely so there's a lot of folks who maybe don't like the sweet overly spiced christmas ales that are on the market so we're like so festivus for the rest of us also plays in right in with our beer for people yeah um so I called Jerry. I was like, "Hey, what do you think?" <laughs> hey, what's up, Jer? <laughs> Jer. I, I just call him. It's Jay. McNulty. <laughs> <laughs> JS. It's me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we, we did. We that, that was our opening. So this would have been 2011. We've been brewing that beer since, and then for this holiday season, actually, I get full full shout out to my colleague Chuck, who came up with the idea. He's like. Let's do a Festivus mix pack. Shut up. Where Chuck, there's man. four different styles of beer. Yeah. So Festivus being one of them. And then it was Feats of Strength. Yep. Um, uh, airing of Grievances. Mm -hmm. And then Aluminum Pole. <laughs> yeah. So all four uh, in one package. And if, if you know anything about the Seinfeld episode yeah. that we're referencing, um, uh, the idea was this is an alternate holiday for people who, who find like Christmas too commercial. They find tinsel distracting. <laughs> um, so they would, the only like symbolism. Was Jerry like, Stiller. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was a, was a, an aluminum pole. Yeah. So on this package, it shows how you can like peel the labels off and stack the cans up and create your own oh, aluminum pole. It. So it's this whole interactive uh, fun moment. I know that that and honestly, like you show up to a party with that mix pack, you're, you're gonna be the life you, of the party. You are the party. Yes. Yeah. That's unreal. I, well, I I had a marketing idea for Sam, but apparently it wasn't as good as Chuck's. With you know that Seinfeld episode, which we're referencing, is the um the, the feats of strength, but then there's the airing of grievances. I thought we should have the roast of Sam McNulty, where everyone could air their grievances <laughs> about Sam McNulty. I thought it would have been a hit. We would need a lot more than an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then we could all wrestle. And that's the feats, feats of strength. And coincidentally, for some reason, my siblings and I, there's seven of us. Yeah. Um, whenever we get together, and maybe we've had a couple beers, 
for some reason. You guys always wrestle? So, no, it's we're, we're not really wrestlers <laughs> per se, but someone. It's usually one of my sisters. Um, Emilia will also, oftentimes be like, "Who wants to do a push-up contest? Yeah, or a plank off?" And I'm like, "Really? We're gonna we're just gonna do that? Like, okay." <laughs> we, we've done the like the leg wrestling one. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. yeah. doesn't go well. My my family, we do not do games. We because I come from three boys, and we end up just being way like overly competitive about <laughs> something stupid That's hilarious. and then we just like ruin everything you know and it's horrible um nice but so yeah a few more quick hitters here just uh what is a plate what's a new restaurant that's open that, that might need a little not not love but just a good shout out that's like that, that you could think of that people should go check out um actually one very close to where i live work and play um a good friend of mine morgan yagi who i yep. mentioned earlier um uh, has Bartleby. Yeah, Bartleby's so it's in excellent. The, in the old crop space, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous banking lobby that Morgan, who's got this great interior design eye, yeah. scaled it in such a way that it feels like intimate, sexy, vibey. Um, and he's got, I think at the moment, five Market Garden beers on his on his menu. Wow. So when I, when I leave work and I want to have the best beer in Cleveland. <laughs> and you don't want to go to your own place? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's a Bartleby run in it, which it's beautiful, beautiful space. Um, I love sitting at the bar and it just feels like vibey all yeah, the time. I love it. Yeah. Nice. And Morgan, Morgan's a great guy. He's, uh, he's doing a, doing a good thing over there. Morgan's a good guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like him a lot. Um, an interesting guy. Very interesting. Yeah. Coolest sunglasses in Cleveland. Yeah. Every time I look at him, I'm like, I don't know if I love you or not, but like you are, there's something about you that is just like interesting. He's got that je ne sais quoi. He does. There's something I just can't put my finger about him. Uh, yeah. Interesting guy. That's going to come out very awkward. Sorry, uh, Morgan. Um, <laughs> uh, what's the future for market garden? What can we look forward to? I mean, you got such a, you're building such a big brand. You're building just like that empire on West 25th. What's, what's next. You just, I mean, you just keep opening up restaurants. Yeah. So I, I think we're, we're good on restaurants for a little while. Yeah. Uh, maybe a long while. Um, Market Garden is, is in growth mode. Yeah. So we're doing double digit growth, even though like the craft beer segment, there's so much competition in it. Um, we're thankfully, touch wood, um, growing gangbusters. Uh, yeah. Michigan Michigan's was a big move for us. We're excited about that. Um, How did that come about? Just you're just like you saw the market and they have folks in Michigan have been asking us for years to distribute there. And a friend of ours we've known for decades, has a owns a distributorship there and he's been like hey whenever you're ready to make the move i'm your guy yeah so we finally did it and uh he also distributes in chicago and chicago is another market that we have a, you know there's so many clevelanders yeah that are in chicago that would are asking us to to distribute in chicago so we, we haven't said yes yet sure but it's it's in the back of our minds and on the horizon i would say yeah yeah uh -huh. if you were going to have one market garden beer and then die what would it be so my, my desert island your desert island your desert island market garden beer um it would it would have to be citramax citramax you okay I'll, I'll tell you a story this is you know one kira loves teasing me <laughs> so we were in um uh cambodia yeah we, actually with mark and the wong um so big shout out to my business partner mark's yeah. wife um his better half as it were, so Luang Ung is a refugee from, from Cambodia, wrote a book about her childhood during the, the Khmer Rouge and, and the whole uh, fiasco over there. Uh, s someone you might have heard of, Angelina Jolie, yeah. reads her book, gets in contact with Luang. This is, I think, I want to say 20 plus years ago. They've been like besties ever since. Like, travel together. Um, uh, Angelina's first adopted kid was a Cambodian boy that uh, Luang and Angelina were like riding motor scooters across the country, stopped in an orphanage. Angelina was like, how can I help? And she adopted That's unreal. This, her, her Maddox. Um, it's a great story. Fast forward, Angelina Jolie um, asked Luang if she can make, turn her book. It's called First They Killed My Father. Mm -hmm. um, turn her book into a movie. Yeah. So Angelina brings in Netflix, Luang and Angie, Put, like like wrote and directed the, the whole thing in Cambodia. So the, Mark Luong, Kier, and I fly to Cambodia for the for the uh, film premiere. It's in the Angkor Wat temple, temple complex. 
this Netflix put up this giant outdoor screen and there were like thousands of people there for the opening like the prime minister and president were there and all these dignitaries angelina jolie said some words luong said some words um there was not a dry eye in the yeah. audience i mean it's a it's a beautiful movie highly recommend if you're, when you're on netflix next uh it's called first they killed my father so suffice it to say it's not a rom-com yeah yeah um but it's it's Brilliant. Luong so, is also a force to be reckoned with. She is. She is an She's awesome. Yeah. I, I love her. But uh, yeah, so we're, so the four of us are in Cambodia. It, it was like two weeks, maybe two and a half. Arrive back to Cleveland, jet lagged AF. Yeah. Um, we're, we're at the time, we're, I was still in the studio apartment on 25th. So we're like two blocks away from the rapid station. So we're like rolling our bags in or our backpacks, I think there was, and um, so tired. Like, it's a, I think it's an 11-hour time difference, so, like, Jeez. my world was just upside down. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, Kira, can you take my bag up to the apartment? I'm going to run to Dave's and buy a six-pack of Citramax. Yeah. And she's like, what's wrong with you? Like, like don't you just want to go to bed? I'm like, not, after, not until I've had one Citramax. Not until I've had a little cold one. We'll just say most of the world doesn't have fresh, hoppy IPAs. Sure like we do here. So we're so spoiled. And if, once you kind of get a taste for a, a hoppy, fresh IPA, yeah. and it's gotta be fresh. Yeah. Like, um, like once you get a taste for it, the macro lagers that they, most of the world pours just don't, don't cut it. Yeah. So I literally went to Dave's, grabbed a six pack, <laughs> come back to the apartment. And I was, I like that you went to, couldn't you have just gone to the bar? Like, to your, we were we were closed. It was like you don't have a key. It, it, well, it was, <laughs> just too too complicated. I, yeah, literally, I was like, I could go to the brewery and I'd probably like get pulled back in and have all, all of a sudden like sure a few things to do. I, yeah. like, oh shit! Like oh Sam, what, yeah. What? You know, so I was like, I'm just I'm I'm gonna go, you know, where nobody's gonna bother me and I can just zip in, zip out. I love it. <laughs> all right. So uh, long story short, Sam's favorite market garden beer is Citramax. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, buddy. Anything you want to get off chest? Where can we follow you? Um, on the gram, yeah, Facebook and Twitter. But like, yeah. what, what's your oh Sam handle Sam dot McNulty or Sam McNulty C L E. Okay, yeah. And then Market Garden, just at Market Garden, Market Garden Brew Pub and Market Garden Brewery, Market Garden C L E and Market Garden Beer. Bam. Yeah. And go check out Market Garden. Go check out Brightside. Go check out Bird of Paradise. Go check out Nano Brew. Go check out Clandestina. Go check out. Smoke and mirrors. Got them all. Let's go. Nice done. Let's Nicely go. Done. That deserve, we, <laughs> we deserve a drink. I, I oftentimes have to like pause. I'm like, wait, I'm like going through like the, the list. I'm like, did I miss anything? <laughs> yeah. It's a good problem to have. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thanks for you. Me on, brother. Absolutely. Much love. Appreciate Much love. you.